My name is Krista Hartzik, and I am the Iowa SARE coordinator. As part of SARE, we have a lot of different grant programs, and one of those is a graduate student grant, uh, which our speaker was able to receive. So today we have Sharon Badia Arias here, who is a PhD. PhD student, excuse me, at Iowa State University, as she received her undergraduate degrees from the University of Costa Rica. Her interests are in Iowa or in integrated pest management and biocontrol. And her PhD research focuses on studying mesotunnel systems. So please help me welcome Sharon. Sharon, thanks for being here. Okay, my presentation is called Managing Tech as a living mulch for organic acorn squash and moss melon in mesotunnel systems. As uh, I was introduced kindly, my name is Sharon Valilla Arias, <clears throat> and the co-authors of this research were Kefas Mande, which is a PhD student. Um, he was in charge of the moss melon part. <coughs> Sorry. And Mark, and Mark Leeson, who was the PI that um, help us with this research along the use. The, this was uh, possible because of a grant that Mark received from the USDA uh, NIFA and for, for the grant that we received from North Central SAR. So thanks a lot. Okay. <clears throat> As some people it might be <coughs> familiar with, and some of the most important pests and diseases complex, complexes of cucurbits in the Midwest. Uh, we have the cucumber beetles, which transmit bacterial wilt, and a squash bug, which transmit the cucurbit yellow vine disease. This last disease is an emerging disease. Might not be that important at the time, but uh, we have observed <laughs> A increase over the years. So that might be important. Hopefully no, but might be important in the future. More important at least. And the bacterial wilt is a, a, a disease is most importantly in moss melon and cucumbers. And the cucurbit yellow vine disease is mostly seen in squash and pumpkin. The management of these diseases is through the vectors. So spraying insecticides is a management a option that a lot of people uses. Rotating from cucurbits, meaning using or planting different crops which are not a host for this uh, insect. Use perimeter trap cropping, which is basically planting a different crop uh, around the main crop, uh, which is going to attract the pest and spray those mainly. That is tragedy. I think there are there is different results, some more in, in positive, some more in, in some less, um, but it's it's a, a option. And use barrier strategies. That is another option in which I'm going to um, elaborate. For organic management, um, we the insecticides that are allowed are sadly are less effective than the other uh, insecticides. Therefore, um, the barriers are <coughs> excuse me. barriers are one option. And has examples of barriers. We have low tunnels and mesotunnels. So this is a picture showing low tunnels and meso means middle size. Uh, so mesotunnels are a little bit bigger than low tunnels. To expand on this, these, the, here I'm showing two more pictures, um, a picture of low tunnels and, and a picture of mesotunnels. This is Kefas installing one of our mesotunnels. So low tunnels, <clears throat> the cover of, of these tunnels are spawn bound polypropylene. They're, they are usually 18 inches high <coughs> tunnels. 
They are wire supported. They are installed from transplant until bloom. And they do have some limitations like the short term protection that they provide because they can be installed when they at transplant, but they need to be removed at bloom to allow the pollinate, pollination to happen. Another limitation is that they can overheat the cucurbit seedlings, especially in very hot days. <clears throat> the mesotunnels, by the other hand, are covered by this nylon mesh fabric. <clears throat> they are bigger, they are 3.5 feet high tunnels. They are also wire supported and they can be installed during, during this whole full season. They do not overheat. That is one of the reasons they can be installed for the whole season. They can be sprayed through them. We can spray through them. And they are tougher than the spawn bound. This picture shows that because of the size of the mesh, they stop the, the pest but uh, they allow the wind and the liquid from the spray bomb, uh, spray bomb to pass through them. However, mesotunnels also have some limitations, such as they exclude the pollination, pollinators, as I am trying to show in this picture, because of the mess, mesh, and they also hinder the weed control because they are these physical barriers that must be um, removed in order to um, control the weeds. <clears throat> to come up with some solutions or possible solutions, we <coughs> excuse me, we perform field trials during 2020, 2021, and 2022. Um, we performed some trials to come up with a pollination strategy and some others to come up with a weed control strategy. We did this for two different crops, the moss melon variety Athena and acorn squash variety table A's. So I'm not going to expand on the pollination trials, but I want to share with you and mention what we have done during those three years, we installed these three row mesotunnels of 150 long, uh, those were 150 feet long mesotunnels. They were this big in order to try to make a commercial size um, field so we could have a better um, sense of what, ha what, what could happen with the uh, pollination. We compared three different treatments. Uh, one was a full season mesotunnel in which we installed a bumblebee hive in the middle of the mesotunnel in the, in the second row. We had an on off on treatment in which we installed the mesotunnels at transplanting. We waited until bloom. We removed the nets for two weeks to allow the pollination to happen and then we reinstall the nets. And then we also had open ends in which we only open the ends for those two same two weeks and then we reseal it. I'm not going to expand <coughs> on this. I'm just go going to, I want to mention that we had different results depending on the crops. And if at the end anyone is interested, I could explain a little bit of this and um, expand. But I want to share with you what is uh, the theme of the, talk, of the talk for today, which is weed control trials. So for the weed control trials, we also perform it for the three years that I, that I mentioned. We also had three rows, but in this case, 30 feet long mesotunnels, which you can observe in here. And the, um, we, we tested living mulch to control, with, uh, control weeds. Also, or uh, yeah, also we, we did this for moss melon, variety Athena, and acorn squash, variety table A's. 
to control weeds in organic production, we don't have that many options. So that's why we decided to use a living mulch or test it. Some of the advantages of using a living mulch is that they can protect the soil against erosion. For instance, in this picture, you can observe how the soil can get eroded after a <coughs> rain event. The living mulches also build organic soil, organic matter, because all of this land material and the roots that we cannot observe in this picture, for instance, gets into the soil and helps to build this organic matter. And they also suppress weeds and weed seeds. I will expand on this with all results. So for 2020, um, we tested <coughs> four different treatments in the soil porous between the plastic rows. We had a wood fabric uh, treatment in which we installed the wood fabric in here. Then we tested TEF, a non-coated TEF at two different densities because we didn't know what, which density uh, was the best for our, our system. So we tested TEF at four pounds per acre and TEF at eight pounds per acre, both non-coated and bare ground. The TEF, we planted it with a, a Gandhi cedar. Here you can see a picture of Kefas uh, just like uh, planting it just before uh, starting the transplantation, the very same day. For the markable yield of <coughs> moss melon, in here, in the X uh, axis, you can observe the different treatments. And in the y-axis, you can observe the pounds per acre of moss melon. You can observe in here that the TEF reduced the yield in comparison to the wheat fabric. If we move to the acorn squash results, I am also showing here the pounds per acre of acorn squash and the different treatments. And in here, you can observe that TEF at four pounds per acre, reduce the least the uh, yield, was similar to using the wheat fabric, <clears throat> and was less, um, reduced the yield less than the eight pounds per acre. So that part of the changes that we made <coughs> for 2021 and 2022 is that we planted the TEF, or we decided to plant the TEF at four pounds per acre. And we decide to, decided to mold the alleys in this treatment at four inches height at bloom. <clears throat> in this picture, I want to point out that this is TEF and you can observe only few different widths around there because the TEF is when, when established properly, it competes very well against the widths. This one is a picture of one of the early workers uh, mowing the weeds. You can observe how many weeds we had in the alleys. And in this picture, this is how the TEF looks like uh, just after <coughs> or very close to harvest. <clears throat> All this organic matter gets incorporated into the soil and the root system that they produce. It's very big. I am going to show you a picture. So all that goes, goes into the soil. Um, TEF do not overwinter, do not survive where I was winter. So that is a very good uh, option to, to control weeds. <clears throat> so in 2021 and 2021, 2022, we tested five different treatments. One uh, still was the wood fabric installed in between the alleys. We had a non mold TEF planted at four pounds per acre, a mold TEF planted at also four pounds per acre, a mold bare ground, and, and a non mold bare ground. <coughs> Here I'm showing the markable yield of the moss melon for 2021 and 2022. 
in the y axis you can see the pounds per acre and in the x axis you can see the different treatments. For musk melon <coughs> in both the years we observed that the mode TEF had a similar yield in comparison to the wheat fabric, which is very promising. So mowing TEF at bloom eliminates yield drag. Also here, I'm showing you the wheat growth um, in between the alleys for the most known uh, trials. And in here, you also can observe that the mode TEF reduced the uh, wheat significantly. Here I'm showing the grams of wheat, dry, dry wheat uh, weight, um, inside a six feet, six square feet <coughs> quadrant. So mowing tef at bloom reduced the weeds. However, in 2021, um, well, acorn squash blooms at a different time in comparison to the moss melon. So usually <coughs> um, moss melon takes around 21 days to bloom. Uh, acorn squash takes around 35 days to bloom. So in 2021, because we decided to, to mow at bloom, because it's when we were moving the, the, the mesotunnels, the, the nets, uh, we decided to mow at 35 days after transplanting. This for the acorn squash. But you can observe that the markable yield was significantly, significantly lower than the wheat fabric. So in 2022, we decided to mold earlier the, the TEF in between the acorn squash and also the bare ground for the mold treatments. So in here, you can observe what happens when we mold 21 days after transplanting. So mowing TEF and bare ground 21 days after transplanting reduce the yield drag in acorn squash. For the width growth for the acorn squash, <coughs> when we mowed 35 days after transplanting, the, we observed a reduction of the width in comparison to the other treatments. But when we <laughs> use TEF and mow it 21 days after transplanting, that reduction was very similar to the wheat fabric. So mowing TEF 21 days after transplanting reduced weeds. We also perform an A economic analysis. So we made a partial budget to compare between treatments. We used the cost of materials and labor that were different between treatments. And the yield resulted from the different treatments. <coughs> As I showed you before, the same yield. So we made this, um, use this formula, which is the cost efficiency. It basically is taking the yield of a given treatment, let's call it treatment A, between the cost of that treatment. And we divided that between the yield and the cost of a second treatment. That give us the um, cost efficiency. So for instance, if the cost efficiency exceeds one, that means that the treatment A is more cost efficient efficient than the treatment B. And so this is a comparison between one treatment and the other treatment, what it gives in yield in comparison to the cost. <coughs> so the economic analysis for the most melon, <clears throat> here in the y-axis, you can see the relative cost efficiency rate. This baseline is uh, at one, and um, in the different, in, in the X axis, you can see the comparison between the different treatments. So for instance, NMB means non-mode bare ground. 
MB means mode background, LF means landscape fabric, NMT non mode TEF, and MT mode TEF. So here we are showing different comparisons, <coughs> and we have three different graphs in each comparison. The, the one that has bricks, that one is for 2021. The one that is that is pointed, that is for 2022. And the one that had has lines, that is for the two-year average. And remember, the baseline is at one. So for the moss melon, basically, <coughs> the landscape fabric and the motif give a very similar uh, result meaning those two treatments are compared in, in the economic analysis. So the cost efficiency of mowing TEF was similar to use with fabric. <coughs> and those were the treatments with the higher, uh, higher yield. If we jump to the acorn squash, here I'm showing the same, um, the same graph, the relative cost efficiency baseline, and the two, two years and the two year average and the same treatment. For the acorn squash, I want to point out that these two, <clears throat> 2021 and 2022, the mowing was done at different times. So I want to um, comment on the 2022. That is what is very similar between the mode TEF and mode Bergam in comparison to the landscape fabric. So the cost efficiency of mowing TEF and bare ground 21 days after transplanting was similar to using, using a wheat fabric. <clears throat> so in terms of how much is invested and how much is returned, those two are similar. <laughs> However, the labor requirements are different. And I think for this presentation, um, that that is important so farmers can make decisions based on what they have available <laughs> so in here i'm showing the uh, labor time in hours that we spent in or 30 feet mesotunnels that in the y-axis and in the x-axis we have the different weeks that we had or experiments on place the yellow line in here is wheat fabric. The red one is mode TEF, and the green one is mode Vera. So I want to point out that wheat fabric had two peaks on labor. One is the installation, which <coughs> was high, uh, higher than the other treatments. Uh, mode Vera didn't have any um installation is basically ha having or widths the widths that that were in place which might different might be different in comparison to other places but well that that is not the point um mowing tef for the mow tef treatments we had to plant the tef as i mentioned before so that had some labor involved <coughs> but not as much as installing the wood fabric then we had some labor here to mow the, 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 the mow treatment. But here, to remove the landscape fabric, I think that is the most significant fix on labor because we cannot, we couldn't let those on place during, <coughs> during the winter. We had to remove it. <clears throat> so the labor for mowing TEF or bourbon was much less than the weight fabric. So as a summary, <clears throat> mowing TEF three weeks after planting eliminated the yield drag in moss melon and reduced it in acorn squash, meaning that using TEF and managing this TEF might be a good uh, option to control weeds under this system. And even not necessarily with the mesotunnels, but by themselves to control weeds. 
<clears throat> the most cost-efficient treatments were the landscape fabric, followed by motif in moss melon, and motif and mold bare ground in a green squash. <laughs> and living mulches reduce erosion, builds soil organic matter, and have no disposal disposal problems, unlike the wood fabric. So some of the considerations that might uh, be important to to well, some of the things that that might be important to consider are these other services that using a living mulch uh, represents and uh, the amount of labor and so many other factors that you might want to consider. This is the picture of the TEF root, the TEF roots under the plastic mulch. <coughs> In 2020, I think TEF has uh, moved the plastic and he observed all these roots from the TEF going um, under the, the plastic mulch. So all these roots, first, they can compete against the crop because they are very massive. But that is one of the reasons why I think by mowing it, you are also controlling the whole plant, meaning also the roots. And then that might be one of the reasons why um, they are not that aggressive when mowed. And um, I also want to mention on this picture, these um, <clears throat> naked soil line, like alleys that you're observing here, are the ones in which we removed <coughs> The landscape fabric so i want to point out that in that treatment that soil was going to be naked for the whole winter in comparison or in contrast with using the other treatments which were um tef and the mode um fairground that those treatments are going to be worried <coughs> protecting the soil in further some take-home message uh, messages. Tev has a promise has promise has a living mulch for organic rubid production. Um, Tev <laughs> has also been used for pumpkins. That is, uh, we found this information from Rhode Island uh, University, and we use this um, to come up with this possible re uh, for this research. So if you want to continue reading about TEF and some of the considerations that you want to, to consider, that, that work might, might be of your interest. Mesotunnels showed profit potential for organic moss melon production in the upper Midwest, <clears throat> but less for, let's so for the acorn squash. I know that I'm not showing this information in here, but I invite you to read uh, some of the publications that we have so thus far, because that might be something to consider. Basically, the most melon, <laughs> the pressure of the um, cucumber beetles and the disease that they carry is very high in, in Iowa, um, and it's not that high for the acorn squash or the squash box and the uh, could be yellow vine disease. This might change, this might not change, but it's it's part of the research that we have done. Uh, Mesotunnel's results can vary with, a, with geographic region. That is something that we observe uh, because part of this research was done, or this research was done in Iowa, that is the results that I am presenting, but we have some colleagues that made the same experiments or similar experiments in New York and in Kentucky. So you might see differences uh, with the mesotunnels, with the pollination, with control, everything. So that is something that you might be interested in checking. For future re research, we think that, um, or we have here from uh, farmers that extend mesotunnels to other crops might be something interesting. <clears throat> I I remember one farm farmer using or trying to use mesotunnels for a, a broccoli. So if you if someone uh, incorporates mesotunnels under their toolbox, uh, 
using it in different crops might be something interesting. And grow multiple mesotunnel crops in the same years, in the same year, and that might be something interesting too. I invite you to check on the tips for using mesotunnels. This is <laughs> a grower's manual that was put in place in from our group. This is the link to to get to the grower manual, and I'm sure that you are going to have access to this presentation. And you also can Google current COVID and, and you will uh, find that information. Some TEF recommendations, uh, seed and water at crop transplant. Uh, watering is especially important if the days are too hot, if the soil is too dry, you might want to, to water a little bit. We have water um, with the mesotunnels in place. We have water just above with a hose. So that is something that you can you can try if you have it, have the, the these tools. Uh, something that I haven't mentioned that I think is very important too is <coughs> we tried to plant teff ahead, like one week ahead the transplant, transplanting the main crop and that didn't work that well because the teff was coming with small um, plants and with the tractor, they got damaged and they didn't come up. So after we came up with this option in which we, uh, the soil was prepared, the plastic alleys, no, not the alleys, the plastic um, rows were put in place in that, at that point, the same day of transplanting, we planted the teff, and then we, uh, just after that, the tractor came and transplanted, transplanted the main crop, and then we closed <laughs> the mesotunnels. If it didn't rain in the coming days and the soil was too dry, then we watered. So something to, to mention, we, we have tested different options, and that was the best one. We also recommend mowing to two to four inches, 21 days after transplanting for both of the crops, the moss melon, moss melon and the acorn squash. And we recommend using a flail mower on a busy tractor. Some acknowledgements that I want to, to give, uh, Dr. Wendon and Dr. Nian Chen, they were the researchers in charge of the economic analysis. This economic analysis gave us a better idea on what, what to recommend. So we want to acknowledge their uh, contribution. And to Jose Gonzalez, which was the um, lab manager at the time, he made it possible, a lot of the research, he, he was a, a very important person to make this possible. And he also helped uh, all the group to coordinate like uh, Iowa's group with the Kentucky and New York group, which was a very rich uh, research. Here, a picture of some of the early workers that helped us um, from 2020, uh, 2019, which in which we had made some mesotunnels research to 2022. Here you can see Ted. And we want to thank our funding resources, which were a USDA NIFA and North Central SAR. And thank you for inviting me to give this presentation. I will be happy to answer any questions um, right now, or you can reach uh, to my Iowa State email I will be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Appreciate that information. Um, it's always fascinating to me to be able to see uh, how well the, the TEF did in growing. And I know I especially enjoy visiting when I'm out at the farm. So a couple of quick questions. Um, one was, uh, if were you planning to continue this same type of research 
or transition to something else? Or is your project, your portion of the project complete? My portion of the project is complete. <laughs> right now I'm working or I will continue working for my PhD in biocontrol of um, Erwinia trachepilla, which is the, the, the causal agent of bacterial wheel in moss melon. But if someone is interested on the TEF research, I am aware that some people will continue uh, make, doing research on this area. So <clears throat> Ajay Nair, <clears throat> I think he, he will continue researching on this. And I am aware that the Iowa State Horticulture Farm, they incorporated the TEF in many different areas of theory. And like to manage weeds, I remember that they were using it in areas and that were not being used for crops. So there, I, I think TEF at least is being used and will be continued, people will continue doing research on it. Yeah, thank you. Thank uh, you. One other question was, uh, did anything really surprise you in your research? Hmm. <laughs> thank you for that question. Um. Yeah. The, the picture that I showed <coughs> of the root system for the TEF, I didn't expect it even, like, I didn't, it didn't occur to me to check on the roots, and Kefos was the one that, out of curiosity, he moved the plastic, and we observed that a massive root system, so that is something that, that surprised me, <coughs> and, but, but after talking and after thinking about it, was like, okay, this TEF comes from um, an Af African country, I think it was Ethiopia, and is very resistant to a uh, draw, um, like dry conditions, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so it makes sense that it makes these massive roots to survive these conditions. So yeah, that is one of the things that surprised me a lot. And well, something else is I am an agronomist, so I am used to some so, to the um, work in the in the field. But I but it surprised to me also how much effort we need to put in order to grow things, uh, and the pressure that I, that that is. So that is something else I I want to point out that I, that I admire all that effort that people put in, in their crops. Thank you, Sharon. I really appreciate that and appreciate the um, the questions that we had. And I really appreciate your flexibility um, in, and willingness to present this remotely. So 